All right, he's just gave oh, us a, sweet. oh, there we go, we're live. Cool. All right, um, welcome, Pax Crowd. There's a couple seats up here if you guys want to sit. Uh, I didn't do it right. What happened there? All right, you're gonna fix that. Cool. There we go. Um, so I'm Ed Balduff uh, with SolidFire, now NetApp. Uh, this session is how stuff works. We're gonna talk about live migration in the context of storage and, um, and then replication for Cinder. So I'm gonna start by uh, introducing Alex and he's gonna talk about the live migration piece and then uh, I'll come along and talk about replication. Sure, so I'm Alex Mead. Uh, I've been working on OpenStack for about five years. Uh, I'm at NetApp now, focusing mostly on Cinder and Manila. Uh, and I wanted to talk about live migration, specifically live migration of instances that are backed by Cinder volumes. Um, and what that means is, if I have an instance running on a compute node, I want to get that instance onto a different compute node with no or little downtime. Um, ideally, the guest operating system would have no idea I even did a migration. So there are three types of migrations. Uh, there's block migration, which would be the situation where you have a compute node and the compute node has all of the bits for the instance stored on the compute node. And if you want to migrate that, then obviously you have to migrate all of that information to the other compute node. So you have to send all of the disk block by block over the network. Uh, that can be very expensive, uh, time consuming, and the VM, well, the VM is paused on both compute nodes that whole time. So it's not really true live migration. Um, the other type, shared storage, so this is where you have maybe an NFS share or some distributed file system mounted on both your compute nodes, and the compute nodes are storing the instance information in that share. So if you want to migrate the instance between, you just have to move the memory. You don't have to move any of the disk. Uh, and then there's volume-based, where you've spun up your instance based off a of sender volume, and you don't have to move those bits either because the volume can be attached to both compute nodes at the same time. So there's some false documentation out there that says that you can't do a live migration unless you have shared storage. That's not true, as I just discussed, and we'll prove that wrong in a demo shortly. <laughs> John's clapping because that's been a myth for quite a while. Um, here's a compatibility matrix about when and when certain migrations work. We're gonna focus here on the center volumes section and the bottom right there. So you can see that there's a lot of red around when you have an attached read-only device. So one example of that is the config drive. Let me explain what that is and then I'll explain how that's a problem. So the config drive is one of two ways that you can inject configuration information into a VM. So Let's go over the metadata service first. So the metadata service is basically, here's a special IP that cloud init or any other uh, agent on the VM can talk to to know how to set up networking and the host name, et cetera. Config drive is just another way to do that, except it is an attached CD-ROM disk onto the VM. And some, the reason you would use a config drive over a metadata service is maybe you're using an older version of cloud init or some other uh, agent that doesn't understand uh, the metadata service. Um, so the problem with the config drive is that it is attached to the VM by libvirt as a CD-ROM type. And libvirt can't migrate instances that have CD-ROMs attached to them unless you're on shared storage. And I'll get into that more into the, in the demo part. So let's talk about the flow of live migration a little bit. Uh, colors didn't show up, but that's all right. Uh, the first two steps are owned by OpenStack. That's Nova and Cinder. The three, four, and five are owned by the hypervisor, and then it goes back to Nova and Cinder to do some cleanup. And we'll go more in depth right now. So let's say that we have two compute nodes, um, some storage, and then some sort of storage protocol that we're using, maybe iSCSI, NFS, Fiber Channel, whatever. Um, and let's say we've booted up a VM off of a, vo off of a volume on that storage, and it's connected to the compute node, and the compute node passes it through to the VM, so we have a volume backing the VM. Now let's say we want to migrate that VM off of compute node A and onto some other compute node. 
So the admin can either say, I would like to migrate this onto compute node B, or it can say, I would just like to migrate this. And the Nova scheduler will then say, oh, here's the node you can use, or it'll double check the node you provided saying, hey, this node has all the memory you need, uh, the right instruction set, um, and you know, everything else that is involved in provisioning a VM. So after the scheduler decides that it's okay to migrate to the host you'd like to migrate to, it reserves those resources on the compute node so that no other provisioning requests come in and steal that RAM that you need to do the migration. And then Nova will come in and say, oh, I need to connect the volume to that compute node so that both compute nodes are connected to the volume. So it sets up maybe another iSCSI session uh, to the compute node. And then the next step is it tells the hypervisor to go ahead and start a live migration. And what that'll do is create the VM on compute node B in a pause state. It's still running on compute A. It'll then copy all the memory. Um, this is a situation where if we were doing a block migration, um, it would have to pause both VMs and then copy all of the disk as well. And it would, it would be disruptive and very slow. But luckily, we are doing a volume-backed instance and it can already see the volume on both nodes. But since it's paused on compute B, we don't have to worry about any IO interactions or, or uh, concurrent writes to the volume. After it does that, uh, the hypervisor will pause both VMs and copy all the dirty memory and the CPU state, dirty memory being anything that changed while we were doing the initial copy. Um, you may say, well, this, is, this looks disruptive. Uh, briefly, it might be. Um, there's a configuration setting, live migration downtime in Nova. It defaults to 500 milliseconds, and that's how long it'll allow the guest to be down. Um, hopefully, this is quick enough where the guest doesn't really care, and you don't lose any, you don't bounce any sessions or lose any packets or anything like that. Hopefully. So then the hypervisor says, okay, I've got everything copied over to compute B. Now we can start the VM there and I can delete it off of compute A. But we can see there's still maybe an iSCSI session to the compute A. That's where Nova comes back in and says, okay, let me clean that up. So it cleans it up. Let's go over to the demo where I can actually show you this in action. Let's make it bigger. Is this bigger? No, you want the oh, there green we go. arrow, green thing, make it bigger. All right, cool. So let's start by doing a simple live migration with a, an instance that's backed by a sender volume. Move the mouse out of there. So, oh, I can't read that. Okay, so we'll create a volume. We'll go ahead and do it on our solid fire backend. And we'll create it from an image so that we can boot it into an instance. And we'll wait for our volume to come up. And once it's created, we'll go ahead and boot an instance from that volume. And we'll do all the usual things you have to do with provisioning an instance. And the yeah. key thing is we have config drive, the force config drive turned off in here so that I didn't, in the demo, go to the config option, but it's not checked. Um, I'll show you later in the demo where you actually can check it and how it can affect it. So. Yep. And we're, what we just did was we added an IP to the instance. We're going to start pinging the instance and wait for it to finish provisioning. We've got to go ahead and uh, make it so that it responds to ping traffic. And we'll go ahead and look at the console to make sure it's booting up. And there's nothing special here. It's just booting an instance from a volume. All right, so it booted. We can see it's pinging just fine. Now let's go to the admin panel where we can start a migration. And we can see that it's on our second compute node, if you saw that really quickly. We'll go ahead and list all of our iSCSI sessions. We can see that there's one on the second compute node. We'll go ahead and start a live migration to move it to the first compute node. Still pinging. Now it's got a session on both compute nodes. 
Now it's probably doing that copy. And it'll cut over here in a second. All right, so live migration is done. We can see that there was one little miss on the ping there. I don't know if that was related, but it might be, but it was just one. Um, <laughs> and then we finish that migration. We can do this with any iSCSI storage, uh, NetApp, uh, SolidFire. Uh, we're doing it here with our ONTAP backend uh, over in our iSCSI right now. We'll go do all the same things that it requires. Spin up an instance from that volume. And we'll do the same thing. We'll ping it. We will remove that security rule so it will respond. All right, we'll wait for it to boot up. We skipped ahead a little bit, now it's booted. And we'll go ahead and list the connections on our storage. On the bottom left there, we can see there's one. And our node, or our VM is on compute node one here. We start a migration. We can see it's got two connections. We can see that both on the back end there and on both compute nodes. And it's done. And we can see the hosts had changed. So now I'll show why config drives are bad and how that doesn't work. And that counts for CD-ROMs, too. So the config drive is mounted as a CD, but if you had an ISO CD mounted, you'd have the same problem. So we'll kind of go through this. And I'll, we Serial over ports, the, too, apparently. Yeah. All right, so we're creating the instance. But this time, we'll go ahead and check the config drive option. Should have sped it up. <laughs> it's your fault. <laughs> Ed made the demo, everybody. Excellent job. Try to speed up the parts <laughs> that aren't relevant, but I guess I could have sped it all up more anyways. It'll... You need that downtime so you can collect your thoughts. So we can see it booting up here. It should boot up just fine. Config drive shouldn't hurt any of that. OK, so it's booted up. Now let's go try to migrate it. Put it on our first compute node. And we see we get a failure, but it doesn't really say anything other than failed. Um, and we'll get more into that here in a minute. Um, this is a problem even on NFS storage. Doesn't matter who you're using, Liver just can't support migrating those read-only devices, unless we set up shared storage. So we'll go ahead now and configure shared storage for our VMs, or for our compute nodes. So we'll create an NFS share on our ONTAP backend here. And we've got our NFS share. So what we'll do is we'll hop on our compute node. We stop the Nova service. We'll mount our NFS share. And what we're doing initially here is we're going to mount it to a temporary directory, copy all the existing instance information that we already have on the compute node into the share so that it has all the information about stuff we have already done. This I should have sped up. So it's copied. <laughs> now we'll unmount it. So keep a key point here is that this shared storage that we're setting up right now is only for the config drive. So if you don't have config drive or, or attached CD-ROMs, you don't need this. But it's kind of to show the hybrid uh, approach here. So we've kind of gone through. The first step was just migrating instances that use the metadata service and had volume-backed um, storage. So now we're, we're going to do a hybrid here. And this is also a cool trick if you're trying to test it out with DevStack. You just spin it up normal, and then you go ahead and do the copy thing. Yeah. And you don't have to worry about yep. weird local conf stuff or anything if you're familiar with DevStack. Um, so now we've mounted it on our first compute node, and we're just mounted on the second compute node, and we're just mounting it over top of the instances directory that Nova's already using. We'll start our Nova services back up, and that's all you have to do is set up shared storage. So why don't we go ahead and prove that that works now, migrating an instance with a config drive. That is backed by a sender bar. All right, so we'll launch an instance, instance just like we did before. 
of our solidifier volume. This time we'll check the config drive box. All right, so we've got our instance. Now we'll go ahead and let's just take a look at our NFS share here and see that it has all the information for the instance on both compute nodes. That'll, that'll prove that we have our shared source uh, correctly. Yes, it exists on both. And you can see the config drive there as the second line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And let's go ahead and find out which. We can see that it's on our second host here. So let's go ahead and migrate it over. So we can see our connections just like before. And we'll migrate it. It said green stuff this time. That's better than red stuff. Now we can see it's connected on both. All right. Looks like it did the migration, and it's on the new host. So I think that's all for the, oh no, there's a little bit more. Oh yes, we're gonna do it again on NFS to prove that it works no matter what the. Or you can kill it. <laughs> the storage you. protocol. Yeah, this work, yeah, there's actually LVM in this setup. We, we videoed it, but then we decided to take it out in the essence of time, so. Um. This part's sped up, so you don't have to do like the whole, whole thing, so. Cool, so we got our instance. Well, let's migrate it. Boom. And we'll wait for it to complete. You can see it's migrating. I know you want me to skip it so bad. That's 90% that's of it. Oh, come on. Oh, oh it did it. OK. It yeah, did. there you go. It might have. <laughs> you never know. I don't trust demos at all anymore. OK. Cool. So there's a few gotchas you may have noticed. Uh, when we tried to do the migration with the config drive without shared storage, it aired. But all it really said was I failed. Uh, it didn't say why. Um, there's a few other situations that can happen where you don't even get that message, um, such as if your hypervisors can't communicate, then what will happen is the migration will fail, it'll go back into active state for your instance, and it'll still be on the same host. So there's no notification that it failed unless you're paying really close attention. Also, uh, in Mataka, this has gotten a little bit better with upfront checks uh, to make sure that the, it thinks it can do the migration and won't even have to fail later on. Now, and some Newton, of this was even worse in older versions where it just, it was really frustrating because it would not move and you couldn't figure out why. So there's been a lot of cleanup. The more modern OpenStack you're on, the much better you are. And yeah. Talk about Newton. And you can always comb the logs, but nobody wants to have to do that, right? If it's an obvious issue, you'd rather be told about it. In Newton, um, I've been working on a feature called User Messages. It's a working title. Um, Here's an example of an issue that might occur. Uh, let's say it couldn't do the multiple attaching to both compute nodes. Uh, so you could get an error like this saying, hey, I couldn't, I couldn't map it to both. Um, and this is more helpful than not knowing fail at all. And then I can use this information, such as the request ID, the volume ID, et cetera, to look in the logs, find more information easier. Um, there's some really good resources now for live migration. Uh, the upstream documentation has become excellent. I, don't know, I should have looked at who did that, but great job. Um, it, it describes everything about live migration, all the different types, how to set it up, all the libvert flags you can do to speed things up and throttle things. It's crazy. There's also like a blog post for every release of OpenStack about live migration. Um, so there's really good resources out there. And in Vancouver, um, there was an excellent video that goes much deeper into what Libvirt is doing and how to configure that and when you would use live migration, et cetera. So with that, I think I'll turn it over to Ed uh, to talk about replication. All right, so I'm back up here again. If you guys were in Tokyo, uh, a few of us got up on stage and talked about replication in Cinder. Um, we thought it was all fixed then, and it turns out it wasn't quite fixed, so we're back again to talk about the plan. And this time, we got a, the, this cycle got a little farther. So a little bit of history here. This is design number four. 
um, in the replication saga. The first, the first design, and we'll show you a couple of those, um, was really about vendors doing it themselves. So both SolidFire, NetApp, and some of the other vendors out there um, had the ability through extra specs to tag uh, a volume and say that it needs to be replicated, however the back end was set up. So in, in NetApp, it was uh, SnapMirror. Uh, with SolidFire, it was a replication, and that was once it's set up, it got that tag and it put the volume there. I'll show you how to do that in a second. Um, version one um, in Juno was was built. It, it was put out there and everybody expected it to work. Um, the only people that got it to work were IBM. Um, and then there were a lot of issues around that. So that's where we led to design number three, uh, which is what we got up and talked about in, in Tokyo, which is uh, was supposed to go into Liberty in the plan, and it did go into Liberty, uh, the core pieces of it. What didn't happen was, and, and this was by design, was we didn't allow any drivers into the, into the release uh, because they were worried that the core, you know, just like one, if it got into the core and it didn't work for all the vendors, then you'd have like one or two and we'd have the same scenario again. So the, the drivers were kept out on purpose and the reality happened so that we got to what we're now calling 2.1 or we've given them dessert names. I think whoever... I wasn't at the mid-cycle when you decided on the dessert names, but Cheesecake, as we're calling it, um, really found some issues with the way it was designed in Liberty and redesigned it again, um, did it much earlier in the cycle, so we, we were able to get some drivers in there. So we actually have a fully functional um, piece of replication in Cinder in Mataka. Now I say fully functional in that it was functional to the design. Um, the design, there's a lot of discussion around how much to design, how, how flexible it is, uh, what users get to control, what admins get to control. And so we'll, we'll talk, actually, it's at the bottom of this slide, and I've got another one about it. For Cheesecake, it was really going for simple. Um, disaster recovery only. So this is not, oh, I might have a disaster. I want to do a lot of testing. This is site A is a smoking hole. How do I move over to B and, and, and get that, affect that to happen? And it was decided that this is an admin-only uh, occurrence because the admin says, oh yeah, there's like a water leak in the data center and the, the, the storage is flooded. I'm moving it over. The tenants don't actually have control of this because the challenge starts to get, like if the tenants got some stuff failed over and some not and you hit the failover button, do you like do this or you know how, there's a lot of intelligence that needs to happen and trying to get that in one cycle wasn't gonna occur. So we'll talk a little more about that here in a second. Um, but let's go back to you know what was wrong with the first, the first uh, design of this, right? And so here's some examples. Um, just two out of you know for SolidFire, uh, it was in Essex. You put in there um, SF colon replication into the extra specs and it in some other variables, and it just happened, right? And so the the key thing there was a tenant didn't know anything about this. Uh, the admin really had, OpenStack didn't know anything about it, right? It was replicated, and that's good because it's on both sites, but if there's a failure or anything else outside of OpenStack, we got to go flip over, do all the, the stuff on the, the array, and then reconfigure OpenStack to the secondary side. Um, and you can see the NetApp example there, it's NetApp mirrored um, was the, the keyword that, that's in the driver. The SolidFire one wasn't in tree, but you could go get it. The NetApp one actually is in tree, and you can go look at it. So, kind of back to Cheesecake. Um, unlike when we were in Tokyo and we were talking about replication and you had the option if you had a managed secondary or a non-managed sec secondary, and that became challenging. Um, whoa, brightness. Uh, <laughs> all right, uh, that was interesting. Um, so we, we, we've gone to, again, talking about the very specific, very simpleton case for Cheesecake is there is no management of the secondary system. It's, it's not seen initially by OpenStack. It's not that OpenStack, it could be configured to be putting volumes over there, but it doesn't realize there's a relationship. So when you see the demo that we go through, we don't have that secondary in OpenStack. It's just not there. But, open, but the drivers know about it enough to set up replication and auto fail over when you type that special command. Um, when it fails over, non-replicated volumes are offline. So we will show that. They do, so if you, your tenant set this up and they pick something, you'll see I got the storage catalog in there and they pick a volume that's not replicated. When I cause the failover to happen, um, that, that volume is offline because that storage system has burned. 
or is a smoking hole or flooded or the water balloon fight as they talked about in the, in the spec. Um, there's no fail back at this point in time in the design. There isn't a methodology to fail back. Uh, remember, that first system is on fire. Right? That was the design concept, and, and we've implemented the design concept. Is that right long term? Maybe not, and that's where we'll talk a little bit about what's going to happen in Newton with uh, the tiramisu design. And uh, again, no concept of managed secondary. So a big part of this with all these different design changes is that the terminology has changed. So this time we're down to three terms. Um, that's all you'll see. Uh, failover is pretty obvious. That means to tell the driver that it's to use the information, and I'll talk, show you the line here, um, to pass this through to the secondary. So that volume that was amounted uh, from the, the primary storage now gets uh, auto-redirected through the driver to the secondary. It doesn't account for what happens if it's attached. So there's a whole piece of, and this is the thing for you guys to think about as you're designing this. What happens with Nova? What happens to that instance? If that side goes down, um, can I still live migrate it? How do those things pick up? But the storage will do uh, as best it can, as quick as it can. Um, the other concepts that we, we introduced here were um, the freeze and thaw concept or unfreeze. And those are really about, okay, if I do fail over and things are, you know, IO is going to the secondary, do I want snapshots and all kinds of other things to be, to be occurring on that secondary? Or is that something when I do fail over, I'm going to try to limit some of that stuff. So if I do fail, have to fail back or in the future want to fail back, I can limit some of that. So that, those are, these are three separate commands. You'll see them in Cinder now. Um, some of the doc strings didn't get in there, so it's important that we talk about them here and what they do so you can kind of figure it out. Um, the help is there, but not the doc strings. But as part of this, there's the three previous designs. There's a whole bunch of terms that were used. And so I'm not going to go through these, but they're listed up here. Um, although we may reuse one of these, right now we've been pretty good in all these designs about changing terms every time. But you, when you do a cinder help, you will see some of these old terms like promote and re-enable. So um, be care of, careful of that if, as you're going about trying to play with this. So um, how it works. So the driver, first off, the driver needs to be enabled for this. So those, I've got a list of the drivers that are in tree here. The driver reports up to the scheduler that has um, replication enabled and it's true. And that's something that you can't control as a, as a user. That comes from the driver because it's got it in there. Uh, and then you, uh, you put a stanza in there. You've got your stanza in your config file. You actually put this last line in there. And that's the keyword there is replication device equals. And then the backend ID is required. So there's one keyword that's needed in here, and that's backend ID equals. And then the rest of the stuff on that line you see here in blue is all vendor specific. Should have had these slides switched around. So there's um, the replication enabled, disabled, and then there's other vendor specific. Like for exi ex example, HP um, has a sync and, an, and a periodic option. You'll notice our stuff in the, the solid fire piece here was just um, uh, an MVIP, which is our management IP of the secondary, and then the login and the password. So there's a bunch of, every vendor's got a few different things. You got to look at the vendor specific documentation for that. And here's the list of drivers that are, are currently in tree. Um, the SolidFire one, uh, uh, our, our rock star was busy working on the core of this. So we're actually, we weren't in tree, but it's there. So you can get it and pull it down and put it in Mataka. That's what the demo's done on. Um, and the NetApp stuff is going to come along in Newton. So um, sometimes there's, you know, there's lags in things and that's what's going on. These other ones, I don't know, I'm not a vendor for these other guys, but they all have the replication enabled flag in the tree for Mataka. So. So the one kind of ugly in the room is fail back or fail over as we move along. So the scenario that I would like to think about is A failed, I moved to B, everything's working. Now it's time to like clean up the mess, build C, make B primary, and start the, the replication to C. And so that was not built as part of Mataka. I'd say that's probably one of the things that's a little bit lacking. Um, the way to do it, and I'll show you in the demo here, is you go in and fix the database. Um, uh, Alex has put in a blueprint for Newton to, to add this functionality so you don't have to do this by hand. Um, the commands are here. I'm going to make these slides available. Uh, I'll post it on Twitter. So it's a, go follow me on Twitter. I don't post much, but I'll post the link to where I put these slides. So you can go grab this if you want. And so once you failed A to B, you've got this kind of redeflection to B. This cleanup here moves B to be the primary. And then, as you see at the last line here, it's go back to the beginning and set up B to C. 
And so that's, as, as I go through the demo, that's what I'm going to do is I'm going to have A, and I've got A not doing anything. Then I create its replication capabilities to B, go through, and then at the end of the demo, when I'm cleaned up, I'm running fully on B. And if you wanted to set up C, go back to the beginning of the demo. So here's this. And how did you get over to that, Alex? All right. Mouse. There we go. So again, kind of we video these because Murphy lives in demos, and so uh, yeah, we don't want to try to do it live. I do it sometimes. So here I'm going to do some um, some basic sender information stuff. I go through um, do a listing. You see, there's no volumes, and then we're going to um, look at this uh, command service list. It shows all the services, and there's a new option here called with replication. Uh, which will show us the extra replication columns uh, in the display. If you're not doing replication, you can turn that off. Um, you can see it's all disabled. And then um, what, what I'm going to do here is actually create a volume that's, that's this is my example case of not picking replication. So we're going to create one. Um, we're making it on a volume type of gold, which happens to be uh, redirected to the solid fire. Um, and so we'll list it. You'll see it's there and it's active. Um, and that's, again, that's non-replicated. So I, I kind of go back and forth between command line and, and uh, GUI. GUI's a little bit better demo. And you'll notice here I've got two tabs for the two different solid fire arrays. Uh, I'm going through here. These are pr pretty busy arrays. So we're going to sort the uh, account list by um, the heading for the different open stack that's running on here. I've got about six open stacks running on this uh, solid fire. Um, you'll see it's there, same. ID is on both sides. It's, it's on one of them. Um, we go to the other one here. We're going to like look at the cluster settings. It's not replicating. Um, and then did I actually go? I didn't go pull up the. There's no volume there. It's not there. So um, at this point in time, we're going to edit the config file. So we're going uh, here. If you haven't seen the cinder.conf, there it is. Um, we're going to take our stanza at the end and add our one line, cut and paste into there. Again, you can pull that out of the presentation, but. I want to show that. And then uh, here I go through and got to restart all the processes. So we're going um, through. This is all dev stack. So we'll, we'll kill all the processes and start them again. You really only need to restart cinder volume, but I'm a paranoid old guy, so I start them all. Uh, and we sped that up to make it better. So now you can see when I do this, um, replication is enabled for the one. So I've got LVM in here, and it's still disabled. Um, there is no replication there. So here's looking at my storage catalog, and this is where I might pause it for a second. So you can see I've got stuff set up here. I've got LVM uh, in there. I've got gold, silver, bronze. Those are all redirected to the solid fire. You'll see the extra specs here in a minute. And you can see I've got this gold replicated um, volume type here. I always put in the description some charge dollars, like a public cloud may do. Um, and then um, here's the extra specs, right? So we've got this gold replicated, and you'll see that its uh, replication is enabled. And the volume backend name is solid fire. Uh, goes through. So we're going to now create the volume using that volume type, right? So this is where we're going to go set it up. Um, one of the things, the different drivers have some different requirements. The solid fire one happens to note that the replication, the pairing of the two nodes is not there yet. And so it actually creates that on the fly. Uh, and I'll show that when we go back to the GUIs. So here's our, vol here's our cinder list. You can see the gold replicated volumes there. Um, so now when we refresh this, actually, I'm going to go over here and look at the replication pairing. So you can see it's paired uh, in there. And then um, we're going to go look at that account. Go back to the other one. I'm kind of dis dysfunctional going back. But there you can see it's a replicated volume. That's the source. Um, here's on this other window is the target. Again, we've got a filter because we've got a lot of stuff going on in these different arrays. And you can see there it's the target of the replication. So that all got set up. The volume got set up on both sides. Uh, you'll notice the UIDs are the same on both sides. So when it does fail over, it just can pick that up. Um, and here's the command, cinder failover host. I ran it once. Uh, if you only have one back end, you don't need an option. If you have multiple back ends, which I do, um, you got to go find your host here from this service list. Uh, plop that into here, and then it'll run. It's fairly quick, no response. But if you run the, um, the service list again with the with replication flag, you'll see that it's, uh, it's failed over. So at this point in time, you'll notice 
Uh, also in there, in the, um, the active, uh, what's it called, active backed ID, that actually is the IP address that it's using now. So the driver redeflects that over to that, uh, that, that storage unit. So now when we do a cinder list, this is where it's interesting, because you'll see that um, we have our replicated volume at, is, is still available. So as a client, you would see this. Uh, you'll notice the other one is in error. That was the one that we created that wasn't replicated in the secondary, and so it's offline. It's the way the design was, that's the way it was designed. It's doing as, as designed. So be aware of that if you're building something on this. That's how it was supposed to be. Um, and so uh, I go through here and, and just attach this, uh, of course I screw up the typing a little bit, but just to show that I can not attach it, right? I've got a Nova instance running here, so I'm gonna actually attach it to it. If you attach the error one, it's going to error out, but just, just so that you guys see it work. Um, and then we can see it also from the array over here. You'll notice it's not replicated anymore. Um, I didn't go back to the primary. It's still on the primary, so it's still there, uh, but the replication's broken. Um, cinder list will show that it's attached, and I think I go back here in the uh, GUI and show that it comes up in the GUI and show. No, I guess not. I took that out. So you can look at the, uh, the iSCSI admin command there. I, that went a little too fast, but it, it shows that it's coming from the secondary. Um, so how do we fix this? A is dead and we want, to be, want B to be the primary now. This is the, the, the go through and move the cleanup over. Um, so we're gonna stop all the cinder processes here. Uh, sped that up again to make it less painful. Um, so now I'm going to go edit the cinder, I edit the cinder.conf and take out the replication line, right? So I'm going to take out the replication line. I'm going to move my management IP to B. Uh, I forget exactly how I did this. If I made another, yeah, I comment out this. So I'm going to leave that stanza in there, but I'm going to comment it out, put another stanza in that points to B. Uh, but then if you bring it up at that point, it's still got the database pointing to the wrong thing. So that's why we're have to, going to have to go in and fix. So you can see I, I changed the IP address there. Uh, where the line came up, and now fix the database. So MySQL, um, it's a pretty straightforward command, but I know some people are hesitant, but that's why we document it in the slide deck, and we'll have the API and, and some kind of replication command. And this is where we may use the reuse the command. So you'll see here, I pulled up a, a listing of that, uh, that table. I actually do it a second time here with only the fields you need. It becomes a little more cleaner, a little more clean. Um, and so again, we'll make this, we may re-enable, reuse the re-enable command or, or, or promote actually is probably what we're thinking. If you got a better word, suggest If you got a better <laughs> word, we need another word. We're running out of words. So there you can see I, I changed it, the tables changed. And then uh, we go restart the, the cinder processes here. Jerry. Well, Jerry, it. Cherry. 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 Yeah, like what you put on top of the okay, we'll put a cherry on top of the cheesecake. Okay, yeah. that's a good point. Um, so a couple more commands here to kind of show you what's going on. We've restarted the process. Do a cinder list. You'll see that other one's still in error. Uh, we didn't have A there anymore. So this is the way it works in Cheesecake. Uh, and then we're going to go detach it and clean up. you got to go delete them on A. Um, and this is, this is a complicated problem, right? And if you think about this, if I want to auto fail back, then I've got to do a resync. And there's a lot of differences in the different uh, array manufacturers and how they do a resync back. So if I had A and I failed over to B, and now I got to flip back. Um, in OpenStack and Cinder, the, the, the philosophy is we want that to be kind of abstracted. So it's very simple in its Cinder commands and trying to accommodate all the different, uh, the different array types and how they do that resync is, is really tough. And so that's why um, there's a lot of challenge going on. I would encourage you all to come to the design session and give your input. Uh, and so we'll talk about that here in a second, um, what's going to happen with the Newton release. And uh, I'm going to go I go here and reattach it, detach it, reattach it, all that stuff. And I believe we are done. OK, so John Griffith up in the front here is saying it all seemed fine when he, uh, when he merged it. And, and now he's listening to us going, hmm, maybe we need some more stuff. So this is, yeah, again, this is the way the design process goes. So that's where I wanted to, I'm going to kind of, this is my last slide. We're going to wrap up here a little bit. So tiramisu uh, is the next dessert. 
design 3.0 or whatever. Um, and the goal here is to, in Austin, and actually uh, I see Xing here in the, in the audience, so she's actually kind of working through trying to figure this out. The goal was to figure out how to do much more granular, there's kind of two things, uh, much more granular failover. So I can fail over one volume, but then it came into some of the arrays have this grouping construct. Uh, if you're familiar with NetApp, um, volumes from solid or from OpenStack go into flex volumes and flex volumes are replicated. Um, so you may have two cinder volumes that wind up in the same flex volume. They both need to be replicated. Maybe you want them replicated. Uh, I know EMC has a consistency grouping uh, capability that they, I think there's some bounds on replication in that. And so that's the second part is how do I deal with these groupings? Um, and then as out of all of this came okay, if I'm a tenant and I want to fail stuff over, like I want to test disaster recovery, those kinds of things, uh, what happens if I say fail over a cinder volume and there's more in the group that need to be failed over? So these are the kind of problems that are being worked through in, the, in these design sessions. They're very complex. How do I have a one tenant that's failed over some volumes, uh, maybe grouped, maybe not grouped, and he wants to fail them back? How do I resync? Uh, what happens when the, the admin declares a disaster? Uh, what happens if there is a perceived disaster and the tenants fail stuff a few of their volumes over, and then it's not a real disaster, or it is a real disaster, and the admin then fails everything over? Um, what do we do there? What's the right thing to do with non-replicated volumes? You'll see currently they just errored out. Um, what do you do with those? Uh, do, you know, as an operator, you can force everything to be replicated if you want to. That's fine if you're in an enterprise or anything else. So um, there's a lot of work going on. If you've got an opinion, you know, you can come up and give it to the folks here that that care or show up at the design session. Um, you know, we're trying to accommodate everything as much as we can. Can't accommodate everything, so that's that's the moral of the story. And with that, uh, I got to put up the advertisement. I guess is what I'm told. So, got to put the advertisement back up. Any questions? Uh, there's mics over here. The guys in the back wanted me to encourage you to come up to the microphones, or I need to repeat them. So, any. There, so the question is about the cleanup and going into MySQL, it's, it's ugly. There is a proposal to put that into Newton uh, as a, an admin command to Cinder. So um, if you fail over today and then you can run in that I'm failed over mode until Newton, then you'll have the commands in there. Uh, the question is, is the replicated volume uh, addressable so I could snapshot it? Uh, not through, it is once it's failed over. Uh, when it's replicating, you would have to use the array tools to do a snapshot, right? So it would just be solid by your data attribution at the active target site. So what you're saying is you want to snapshot the target even though it's not active? Correct. Yeah, you'd, you'd, you'd need to use the array yeah, tool. Yeah. Yeah, you didn't need to use the array tool. So you're, you see there's a lot of switching back and forth between the array tools and Cinder. That could be the boot volume. So the way we set that up, I just, I just did a simple, I didn't attach it. And, but if, if it's, so the question was, can I replicate a boot volume? Yes, I can set it up that way as a replicated volume and then boot from it. The question back to the audience and the operator is, I've got this booted VM off of this volume. Um, that storage goes away for some reason. It fails over. You're going to need to clean up Nova and bring it up again over there. Yeah, yeah. So I got a couple at the microphone over here. I'm going to take a little preference to those guys. Yeah, just rewinding back to the live migration stuff. Yep. Um, you mentioned that with um, non-shared storage, so block live migrate, VMs has to be paused. That's not true anymore. With the latest versions of LiveVirt and QMU, you don't need to do that anymore. It can actually okay. be live block migrated without yeah. pausing. But you still have the downside of uh, transferring all the blocks. Of course, yeah. I mean, yeah. It takes longer, it's more complex. Whatever, and, and I tried to set it up, and I couldn't get it to work. So okay. it that's, why we, that, that's, why we, that's why we didn't show it. Okay. <laughs> that's why we didn't show it. But, us, yeah. but. Does it work in the current version of Nova, though? Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. It just requires a, I think we couldn't get it to work because it requires a later version of LiveVirt. That's right, yeah. LiveVirt and QMU. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and we're, we weren't at those. Thank you for the input. So the, he was on the mic, so I don't have to repeat that. Good. Uh, so yeah, question about the replication. So you were very clear about the scenario you're considering, which is a smoking hole disaster. Yep. But the command that you showed to invoke the failover, 
Yeah, from what I could see, it seems to be run in the same site as the primary, which is now presumably a smoking hole. I hope you so. have, yeah, so perfect question. Um, I would assume, and we're assuming, you have some kind of HA in your control uh, plane infrastructure so that you have Cinder running you know, on multiple controllers. Okay. So, so the target for the replication, is the assumption that's in a different zone, region, entirely yes. different OpenStack deployment? Yeah, it's, it's not, it, there's no facility or requirement to manage it within the OpenStack that you were, right, okay. were on. So, so yes, I, could, I could have two OpenStack deploy, separate deployments, replication between them, and then after a failover, or after a disaster rather, I could run the, I could invoke the failover from the secondary site? Uh, you could do that with some fancy um, stuff around controller zones, but you could also have like a pacemaker cluster that's right. separated by the sites for the, the initial OpenStack instance. Um, that's what we see a lot of, right, where people set up some kind of a clustering and you can have Cinder volume run on both of them. Right. Okay. So, you. yeah. Yeah, you can, uh, John's up here, uh, and, and you can use Cinder Manage to pull these sites in, in the, in, to, to pull in another uh, array. So if you have a volume that's outside of Cinder and you want to like bring it into Cinder Management, so there's a few things you can do there too. Does the Cinder conf need to be adjusted when, while the, when the failure happened? Like no, the, 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 that line, so the question, you, again, you were sort of at the mic there. Um, the question is, do I have to um, distribute the Cinder conf when I, when I do the failover? And no, you'll notice I just ran the failover command that line that I added to the Cinder conf, you would need to replicate, to put that everywhere when you did it. But then all of a sudden when you declare the failover, it basically is telling the driver, hey, look through the main part of the, the configuration stanza, get to that replication line and do whatever you need to do there. So you don't have to like go about editing the Cinder comp to do the failover. You just have to run that Cinder failover and which backend you want to fail over and it just does it. Now, my question is after the fact, like let's say, from A to B, the failure happened. Now my C has not come up yet. Right? Correct. So there is no provisions for bringing up C. You know, that's why I was editing the database, right? And so that database edit was really A failed over to B. How do I make B the prime? Once I've realized that that's happened and you know, I'm buying a new array and A is really dead, how do I make B the primary? And again, once you follow that demo, you're back to you're running with a single array, and then you can go by C and go back to the beginning of the demo and do the, do the add the line, so. Thank you. Do I have people lined up for the next session or questions? All right, with that, I think we're supposed to be done, so thank you. Uh, I will tweet out the location of the slides and the demos here shortly.